My name is David Warden. Um, for six years, almost six years, I was head of the public relations department for Washington Development Corporation. From November 82, sorry, I beg your pardon, November 81, until January 1986. Were you around in Washington in 1964? No, I had yeah. never heard of Washington in 1964. <laughs> I, I, I came literally in November 1981 after having replied to an advert in a paper. Um, I worked for an advertising agency in, in Glasgow. And um, I was working with clients like John Brown Engineering, weird pumps and people like that. And it was not a very well-paid job, and I was looking for something better. Um, applied for the job with Washington Development Corporation, came down for uh, one, maybe two interviews. And then, to my surprise and delight, I was offered the job. And uh, I then came down, started work in November 1981. Fantastic. What were your first impressions of the place? Well, actually, I came down on a, an interview and I decided to have a look around first before I went for my interview. Um, I discovered the delights of the Silver Dollar Pub in the galleries where I had lunch. I discovered the F. Pitt Museum at the time. And um, I drove past the old hall just to give me a bit of an orientation. But to my benefit for the interview and subsequently um, in my career, I stayed at the village farmhouse in Washington run by a lovely couple called Jim and Jenny Ewing. Um, unfortunately, they're not with us anymore. But they ran the best B&B in Washington at the time. I didn't know that he'd worked for the development corporation in a particular role in community development. And he then subsequently worked for Peter Lee and Newton Aycliffe in a similar role. So really, by the time I had my interview, I knew a lot more about Washington and Newtown mm -hmm. than I did before. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad I stayed where I did know that couple, an enormous debt. Mm -hmm. So how long were you down for when you did the interview? I only came down for a couple of days. I drove down from Glasgow, where I was based, mm. although my family were living in Kirkcaldy in Scotland. And um, I think I stayed overnight and drove back the following day. I think I did it twice, because I believe there was two interviews in total. And could you find your way around the numbered system? No. <laughs> I was delighted when I decided to change everything back to names, which are a lot easier for people to... Uh, get to know. Whereabouts do you live now? Do you still live in Washington? Apart from two years when I left the development corporation at the end of my tenure, mm -hmm. because we all had fixed contracts pretty much, um, I've lived in Washington since November 1981. Uh, I currently live in Biddick in a delightful little bungalow just down from the walk-in centre. I th thought I've come into something here which I really didn't have a clue about. Mm -hmm. I knew about public relations work, exhibition work and things like that because of what I'd done with major companies in, in Scotland in a PR role and also as a graphic designer, illustrator for companies. So I had an industrial background. I was coming into more of a local government background and it was a completely different world altogether. The biggest advantage of Washington was learned quite early on was it was a quango, quasi-autonomous, non-governmental organisation. You say, what on earth's that? What it was is they could make decisions almost instantly on things that mattered, like the development of the new town, attraction of industry, um, e even the education and, and schools. The whole package could be looked at and dealt with very quickly. And um, it saved us an awful lot of time and effort in the development of the new town, which, remember, it only took 20-odd years mm -hmm. to go from a, a selection of mining villages to quite a thriving community who, by late 80s, mid-80s, mid was attracting quite a lot of industrial interest. As you all know, the uh, jewel in the crown was Nissan's decision to use Washington as its base.
What was the development corporation like by the time the 1980s came around? Because I've been hearing a lot of stories of the 60s and 70s. It was um, run at the top by a managing director, a number of directors for different departments, and after that you had the hierarchy coming down. Um, to this day, I'm never quite sure where I stood on that, which probably got me into trouble from time to time. But um, mostly people knew what they were doing. They worked for their department, their department heads then reported back to the managing director and now ultimately the board. Again, a group of um, local dignitaries, some with industrial background, some with local authority background, but basically a very capable group of people able to take Washington in the right direction. I was given a task virtually the day I arrived that had been sitting around for a while. And you might think, what was it? Well, in 1982, in February 1982, I can't remember the exact day in February, 1982 would have seen the 250th anniversary of George Washington, the father of the United States of America. They had had a competition for local schools to design a birthday card for George's birthday. I believe at the time when I first got the brief, the idea had been, had been to give the winner a bike or something as a prize. In my boldness, that's with tongue in cheek, I thought it'd be better if he actually took the birthday card to America and gave it to the White House. So anyway, cut a long story short, and it is a long story, I made inquiries and the people in America wouldn't talk to me unless I was in America on their soil. So cap in hand, I went to see my boss first. I told him the situation. I said, they'll help, but only if I go over to see them. All right. So after a little bit of thinking, I got a summons come up to my boss's office. We then went to see the managing director. And after some consideration, he says, well, if that's the case, I think you'd better go. Mm -hmm. So in January 1982, for the first time in my life, I visited the United States of America, Washington, D.C. By the time I'd got there, I'd been in touch with the um, executive staff of the White House, a lovely lady called Patricia Hoffman, and we met in the old executive building, which was the headquarters for the uh, U.S. government during the American Civil War. So I met this delightful woman, and she said she'd look into what we could do while I was there. I had made, t made contact with the British Embassy in Washington, the Mayor's Office, and uh, Mount Vernon, which was George Washington's home. I was following up some leads that had been given in documentation I'd be handed originally. So in the course of about a week, I contacted all these individuals. And I'll never forget, it was like something out of a spy movie. I met the lady from the White House, Patricia, over dinner in a rather nice restaurant in Georgetown in the suburbs of Washington. And once we'd ordered our meal, there was a, a large yellow envelope passed across the table, which I immediately hid underneath my seat. And she said, if you look at that, there's a breakdown of what we at the White House can help you with. Because of that, the Mayor's Office, the British Embassy, Mount Vernon, and, oh yes, the Smithsonian Institute, which was very important because that's where George's... Um, 250th birthday celebrations were going to be held in the form of an exhibition in February. So by the time I boarded my British Airways flight back to the UK, I had virtually an itinerary for a whole week's visit to the United States for the boy who won the competition, Chap Bulgari, with his mum, Helen, or Mary, I can never remember, and his father, whose name I do forget. Anyway, the idea was that we would come over in February, we'd be met by the British Embassy staff, then on certain days we'd visit 
everywhere that we'd been, we'd had an outline from the the White House staff. As it turned out, um, I should have thought about it myself, but I didn't. It was my direct boss. He said, do you think we could get Look North involved? I said, yeah. So we did. This involved my trailing up to uh, New Bridge Street, where the headquarters of BBC Television were at the time, meeting a lady called um, Diane who Diane Nelms, who was one of the presenters or, or researchers for the programme at the time. She made me welcome. She introduced me to Mike Neville, who was the presenter. And he asked me if I'd be staying on later to go at the BBC club with them for a drink. To my credit, I stayed behind because by this time the producer had finished a swim locally. He came back, listened to my proposal. The one thing we couldn't do was say, we, these seats, you know, we'd like to give you these seats. The way things are worded, we managed to come up with a compromise where if we said to the BBC, this is what we'd like to do, they could only say yes. Mm. So anyway, I'll never forget the night out with Mike Neville. What a delightful man and company he was. That's as far as I'm going to go with this story. Cut a very long story short again, we've been in touch with British Airways the local representative. And he said, it's a pity because we were going to take his, Gary's mum and dad and it turned out a BBC film crew with us. He said, it had just been you and Gary, we'd have tried to get you a seat on Concord. Oh. Mm, wow. Didn't happen. But when we all went down to London, Gary, his mum and dad, myself, we were taken down by the development's chauffeur in a big limousine. We stayed at a very, very nice hotel in London and we had the run of the executive club at Heathrow when we arrived for our flight to America. While we're flying across the Atlantic, in the morning I got a call from the purser and the aircraft um, would Mr Warden please indicate where he's sitting. So I waved my hand and he asked if Gary and I would like to go to the flight deck. So we went up flying over Nova Scotia in the early morning, seeing the snow-covered hills and everything. It was breathtaking. When we got back to our seats, um, we were offered soft drinks for Gary, but we were offered champagne for his mum and dad and myself. And of course, the BBC film crew waving in the background weren't left out either. When we got to America, we were virtually treated like VIPs. And... Um, the only thing I got wrong was the choice of my hotel, which was a trap lodge, which in Britain was pretty all right. As it turned out in America, it wasn't quite as good. Gary and his mum and dad were quite happy where they were. The BBC made their own arrangements. But where we were staying, we had the benefit of a, a local police patrol coming in every night for their break. And we got chatting to them. They let Gary uh, wear their caps and parts of their uniforms. It was very good. But it was central for us to fit everything we did. I did hire a car and we drove around to various venues. When we got to the White House, we were met by a group of children um, and the press secretary for, for the president, who was Ronald Reagan at the time. And we were also following day given lunch in a senior staff dining room in the White House, which was unbelievable. Mm. To this day, I do remember that Gary had a Knickerbocker glory for his dessert. I didn't, but I did have a damn good steak. Mm -hmm. When we went to the Smithsonian Institute, we were interviewed by a reporter for the Washington Times. And um, again, what a delightful place to be interviewed. I, I've been a keen aviation fanatic. Um, Gary was quite impressed as well. We went to the the monument at the end of the mall, and there was a ceremony going on to celebrate George's birthday by veterans of the American forces. And we were, you, you would have thought we were royalty when we got to the door. They took us up to the very top of the tower. They were even going to take the windows out so we get better photographs. We said, no, better leave them in. <laughs> and as we came down again, President Reagan flew over in his helicopter going to commit the ceremony somewhere else. We visited Mount Vernon, George's home, and again, absolutely superb place, and we were taken around by the chief guide, 
and um, you could see why he enjoyed the quiet of Mount Vernon as compared to the hustle and bustle of what Washington must have been like in the um, 18th century. Mm-hmm. Yes, I hope I got that date right. We also attended George's birthday party at the Smithsonian as guests on the VIP opening, and we had seen nothing like it. It was absolutely stunning. We were all given souvenir brochures. Unfortunately, they haven't survived through time. So I believe Sundan Archives may still have a copy of the brochure in their um, cellar somewhere. We actually attended an English lesson in a school laid on by the mayor of Washington, Marion Barry, um, who was a bit notorious later on down the line for being a bit naughty. But again, we couldn't have been made more welcome by anybody. And it was interesting, given a class in America, we completely different classes in the UK. But um, I think we got standing ovation at the end of it. So all in all, we had a terrific trip over there. And the repercussions carried on for quite a while afterwards. Because in April 20, in, in April 1982... I went back again with um, the chairman of the Development Corporation, the managing director, and other VIPs, where we laid out trees along the George Washington Parkway leading from D.C. to Mount Vernon. Again, a superb time to have been there. And um, I got a chance to look around Washington a bit more than I did my first visit. One of my staff managed to go out again in July because we'd had a an essay competition for older children at that time. And as it was an all-girl winning group, it seemed right that one of my uh, women, sorry, one of my female staff took the lead on that one. And again, it went off very, very well. And I remember at the end of the day, our figures, because we were acting like our own in-house ad agency in a way about what publicity we got, how do you measure it? Well, it was column inches or airtime on BBC radio or any radio or television station. And when we came back from America, we actually got the equivalent of 13 minutes of prime time on Look North. And going by the calculations, that was over a million pounds worth of publicity. We did get coverage in the Washington Times. We had various other publications covered the events that we'd taken part in. And all in all, I believe it cost the corporation about £7,000 for the the trips that we actually did. So so that was the main highlight for me. After that, through the years, um, following the lead of our commercial department through a, a really superb chap, called Norman Batchelor. He was the commercial director. Um, We had exhibitions all over Europe, a few in the UK. And my job would be to contact the local press in Denmark, Holland, France, Germany, and um, Sweden. Mm -hmm. And then set the ball on, oh, I forgot, Switzerland, Geneva, I I don't want to forget Geneva, it's a superb place. So we we, we also um, designed the exhibition stands. We'd hire a shell scheme by wherever the exhibition was being held at the the Salon de Composant or something in Paris or the Port de la Défense, other venues in Copenhagen, uh, Amsterdam, all over the place. We also took many exhibitions to places like The Hague for the British Embassy and things like that. Um, We did exhibitions at um, the National Exhibition Centre and also at Wembley on various occasions. But again, my job entailed going to see the press, giving out press packs and trying to arrange interviews as, as and when with the senior staff, the directors or the managing director who happened to be available. And we even had the press conference in a biotech exhibition in Geneva where the number of journalists that turned up was amazing. And 
To be honest, there weren't many biotech journalists in Geneva. And my boss was very keen to see a lot of people attending the press conference. So what I did, I rounded up a number of the exhibitors and asked if they'd like to have lunch with us mm. at the press conference. And to this day, I believe everybody thought, my God, a number of journalists have come along to cover the story. But the outcome of all the exhibition work that Washington Development Corporation did, the publicity we did, and we had a, or an enormous budget at the time. Um, I can't remember offhand how much it was, but I believe it was around about half a million pounds a year for the four and a bit years that we were dealing with publicity. And for most of the time, we were dealing with our own press inquiries, our own advertising needs, our own promotional uh, materials, uh, brochures, flyers, exhibition panels, photography, TV and radio interviews and stuff like that. So the money was well spent, but there was always pressure on us to have a proper ad agency involved. So towards the end of my stay, this is what we did. And then my job was liaising with the ad agency and other media outlets at the time. And I found the biggest USP, you've all heard that phrase, unique selling proposition for Washington Development Corporation was the fact that it had a coat of arms. We did check out all the opposition in the big tabloids, Times, Financial Times, Daily Telegraph at the time. And when we compared a rough idea of an advert using the corporate coat of arms, Washington Development Corporation stood out like a sore thumb. Therefore, from there on in, the last of my stay, the coat of arms always appeared on advertising and promotional material from Washington Development Corporation. We even carried on using a, a typeface, which I didn't like at the time, but it became ours, called American Typewriter, which was used throughout the four, four and a half, five years that I was there. Towards the end, we started developing different imagery and... Um, my term came to an end officially in January 1986. But looking back over that, um, and another promotional activity, which with your permission, I'll go on to a bit. I believe we had a success rate better than most PR departments that I came across. I believe a lot of it was down to the fact that I had come with a background of industry rather than local authority stuff. Mm. That's, I'm not ne denigrating it in any way, shape or form, but it gave you a different dynamic mm. to focus your activities. And the fact I'm sitting here now proved that I lasted my time out. Mm. It is a matter of pride with me that I was part of a, a small group of people over the years. I believe the total was about 400 who created a new town in just over 20 odd years of roughly 60,000 people. It still holds its head up today as an example of what a new town can be or should be. We got some things wrong, like the numbering system. We also got an awful lot right. Look at the trees around us. If anything else, we are definitely a green new town. There is no doubt about that. And um, if I had to sum things up on the PR front, here it comes, mm -hmm. I would say it's a new town with a heart of old. The problem is that, again, this is my opinion, up until the end of our tenure as a, a development corporation, there was a, a dynamism about every activity we did and it, it actually permeated the entire organisation. We were fortunate to have a headquarters at Usworth Hall. Absolutely beautiful place to entertain. We had the stables. We had sumptuous banquets and things there. And uh, I probably had my more, uh, more of my fair share than anybody of using it. Because if we had VIPs, that's where they would go. I would often be asked to attend, look after people, because obviously the directors very busy people, they'd probably welcome them to the development corporation. I then looked after their, um, how can I put it, 
the more enjoyable side of the discussions that went on. And this happened with groups all over the place, from people from the British Council. We had groups, obviously, from Japan and other places coming in. But the stables and the standard of um, hospitality that Washington showed their visitors was unbeatable. It seems to me that a lot of people that came to Washington during its creation and, and its ongoing continuity, um, I think I've just been on a matter of peak there or something silly mm-hmm. like that. The people that lived in Washington believed in it. And I was lucky enough one day to be invited to join a group led by Reverend David Horton, who was the chair, uh, sorry, he was the uh, the vicar of Holy Trinity Church behind where we're speaking now. And they had decided in 1983 to hold a celebration of 800 years of the Washington family. I got involved quite early on with David and other groups in the community. And what a delight this man was to work for. Never forget his wife Elizabeth with the tea and cakes coming in every so often. But the meetings were almost always held in the church, um, in David's home actually. And what it was in, in 1183, William de Hartburn had been granted the title of William de Wessington by Hugh Percy, who was the Bishop of Durham at the time. You know, some dirty deeds or you've done me a favour, I'll do you one, you can have a bigger village. And to that end, the family moved, lock, stock and barrel, from Hartburn near near Stockton up to Washington, or Wessington, as it was called, which I believe was an old Anglo-Saxon Viking connection. My history's not that great on that one. Anyway, the ride was to take place over a three-day period on an April bank holiday in 1983, We needed a front person for this. So what I did um, on behalf of the group, I contacted the US Embassy in London. We were good friends by this time. And I was put in charge with a guy who was the chairman of a group called the Sons of the American Revolution. They met in London in the US Embassy. And... um, they're a branch of the Daughters of American Revolution, which is a very powerful group in America, um, led by the ladies looking after that great country. Anyway, I had to go down and give a presentation. Snag was, I didn't have a dinner jacket. I had to go all the way to London, hire one at Austin Reeds in Covent Garden. I'll never forget that. And attend this dinner at the US Embassy in Grosvenor Square. And I had the honour to represent Washington that night. I put my case to them and all the huh, all, all the shakers, dealers and shakers at the time of that organisation were present at dinner. I believe Lord Hailsham was there that night. I, I was overwhelmed. Anyway, the guy that I got involved with was called Sid Telford. I, I subsequently learned that he was head of security in the US Embassy in London. They agreed to help us, as it turned out, and what they would do, he would come up to represent William de Hartburn. He learned to ride with the Metropolitan Police in London and gave him a splendid pair of riding boots, I remember that bit. And Sid and I, we just hit it off from word one. And when he arrived, he had a group of people in a VW minibus that had lots of supplies in the back because we'd be stopping overnight. It's quite a long way on horseback from Newton, as it was, not Hartburn, we'd be set off from. And by this time, we got a number of other people involved. Blue Peter um, loaned us one of their ponies. Uh, Riverside Riding Centre got involved providing horses for myself and other members of the riding group because I learned to ride you can't do PR properly unless you get involved in what you're trying to promote. And I still have the sores on my bottom to prove it. So I did. The other thing is, we all got dressed in medieval costume. 
which were all made by a company in Washington for us. So lo and behold, the April bank holiday, we all met at Hartburn, well, New, uh, I'll get it right in a minute, Newton in Darling, uh, near Stockton. It was quite a chilly, cold morning, bright and sunny, nearly all dressed in medieval costume, introduced to our horses. I got a feisty little so-and-so called Toby, whose aim in life is to try and kill me. As you can tell from this interview, he didn't. So for three days, we split the ride up. Our first part of the journey was from Newton to Sedgefield Racetrack, where we stayed overnight. We were supposed to have had a dinner laid on for us there, which never happened. However, Sid and his little VW friends made sure there was a stock of bourbon in the back of the van, which helped a lot. Not with the horses, but with the riders. We don't know what the girls did. They were in separate accommodation. So we did that. The second day we rode from Sedgefield up to Longley Castle. We were met by people in costume being offered a glass to drink. As it turned out, it was orange juice, not champagne or mead. We had our photographs taken there. I was going to look out for, for one to bring along today, but I couldn't find it. Then the horses were taken back to the stables. The following morning, we met up again at Lumley Castle to ride into Washington Old Hall. And um, it was all time. The weather was gorgeous. And we, there we were with our modern day long johns underneath with sweatshirts and all sorts on under medieval cloaks and stuff. And we rode around Washington and we stopped at the Biddick pub down by the river where the horses and the riders all had a drink. The horses had water, the riders didn't. And then, right, they're ready for you now. So we rode from Biddick up to the old hall. We got here, the VIP still hadn't arrived. So we had to go around the village on horseback again. Ultimately, we arrived and the publicity for the event was outstanding. And it was great being part of something that had so much significance from a town that had it been the other way around, the world would never have heard of. Who'd have heard of Hartburn, mm -hmm. County Durham? But they sure as hell heard about Washington, County Durham. Mm -hmm. It was time and weird by then, of course. Mm -hmm. But... Um, that cemented a friendship that's lasted since. I don't know what the contact is nowadays because I lost contact with everybody. In September that year, we were going to have a, a get-together at, um, where was it again? The Arts Centre at Washington. The night before, it was going to be a Thursday, Sid and his party were coming up from London. I went out for a hack that night, fell off the horse and broke my arm. Couldn't make it. But I believe they did have a drink to absent friends that night, and I was one of them. Yep. But the credit for that ride goes to the group that David Horton, who deserves all the credit, formed to celebrate 800 years of Washington, Washington family. Mm -hmm. And like my pride in the development of Newtown, I think I was probably more proud of proving myself I could ride a horse for three days. Yeah. So I'm getting from this that the story that you thought made Washington distinctive, you know, in amongst all the other new towns, it was the story of um, what had gone really before even the mining villages. It was it was the, the oh, yeah. Washingtons and it, the, it was the, the magic DC of the name connection. Washington because mm -hmm. in the sixties everybody had heard of Washington in America. Mm -hmm. Um, we'd known about Washington, America for an awful long time. Perhaps what we didn't all know was George Washington's history. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen him crossing the Potomac and things like that with his flag um, and things like that, being the first president of the United States and things like that. Benjamin Franklin as his ambassador to France. We know bits about the history. But until I came here, I didn't know where he originally came from. Mm -hmm. And when we did some research, I think we found 52 or 53 different places in the world called Washington. Ah. But the Washington family did travel from Washington, Tyne and Weir, or Washington County, Durham, to, I know they went down to Northampton, and something in the back of my head said they went to Preston, around that area somewhere as well, but that would need a historian to check up rather than myself. But 
no other new town that I can recall had that kind of background. Mm. You've got Telford, you've got Milton Keynes mm. with its concrete cows. Sorry, yeah. I had to say that. We had concrete uh, crocodiles. Irving <laughs> in Scotland. Well, I think Irving in Scotland has got a port. Mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of the new towns were built on green field sites and things like that. Washington was here already and got all the villages together, mm -hmm. melded them into one town. Now, that town has a significance way beyond its original meaning or size, mm -hmm. and that will last for centuries. Mm 